working on my 5 inch gauge sterling single and this is examining the engine in detail on the workbench. If you watch these videos regularly you will know that I've just finished rebuilding a Great Western 14XX locomotive and now I've put my sterling single in its place on the workbench. The first thing I need to know is how it's put together and this small mirror is very useful. I always keep a mirror like this in the workshop just in case I get some swarf in my eye. That way, using my good eye and the mirror, I can remove the eyeball that's damaged, clean it with a cloth and put it back in. This is not just any mirror though, it's a curved one. I think they're designed to be stuck on your existing car's wing mirrors to broaden your field of vision. But they're absolutely perfect for doing this. And with the help of this mirror, I've found the second fixing that needs removing. This was a bit more tricky because it's right in behind the connecting rod and very close to the brake hanger. I have the braking system for this engine, but it's not finished and it needs fitting. I'll do that later. In order to successfully remove this second nut, I had to turn down the end of my box key. Box spanners like this are very useful, but they're not any good at all if you can't get them in to remove the nut. And the good news is that only two nuts hold the running board in place, and the whole assembly comes off as one unit. And here you can see the large left-hand driving wheel without the cover on it. With the running board removed, it's very easy now to lubricate all the parts in between the frames, and I'm using the extension that I put on my Rylang oil can to do this. This is a really good idea, a piece of 8 pipe on the end of your oil can, but don't forget to put a piece of silicone rubber on the end so you can see it and don't poke your eye out. But the good thing is, if you should inadvertently poke your eye out, you do have the mirror so you can use your good eye to put the other eye back in its socket. It's time to give the engine a bit of a run. It's very powerful. I'm holding some Scotch Bright against the tread of the wheel and it's not stopping and there's really not much pressure going in here. Even at this speed, the engine will be going down the track at quite a good rate. Before I run the engine for an extended period, I need to make sure that the lubricator is working. This lubricator is a miniature oil pump. It's really a miniature oscillating cylinder and it's driven via a rocking lever which in turn is driven by one of the valve rods connected to an eccentric on the main crank axle. So there's no problem with the lubricator, it's lubricating the cylinders perfectly. In this clip you can see the rocking arm that drives the lubricator and that's right next to the water pump. This is an axle driven pump, not a crosshead pump like on the 14XX. And very shortly I'll be testing to see whether this works. But first I need to spin up the engine to a really high speed and make sure nothing falls off it. And that's with just 40 pounds per square inch showing on the gauge. The engine's designed to run at 90 pounds per square inch. I'm being a little bit brutal with this engine at the moment, which is not like me, but I need to make sure that it is mechanically good. So first of all, by running the engine at a high speed in short bursts, then moving the reversing lever from forward to reverse while there's pressure going into the cylinders, shows me that this engine is indeed very well made and it runs beautifully. I was very happy with the way the engine was performing, so I thought, well, I'll clean up the safety valve cover. This safety valve cover is made from a piece of gunmetal, and the problem with this and the chimney is it's difficult to machine it all the way down. You can machine it so far, but then when it comes to the bit that fits around the boiler, then generally you have to finish this part of the component by hand, using files, emery cloth, and various grades of wet or dry sandpaper, to shape, clean up and polish the bottom part of the fitting. This fitting needed a little bit more work, there were some tool marks still showing, but by using my polishing spindle with some suitable abrasive, followed by using brasso and a cloth, as you can see now, the fitting looks a lot better. So I looked at the safety valve cover and I'm quite pleased with it. So I just sat back and ran the engine for a while for no particular reason. Before I get lots of comments saying, why is the engine rocking about on the rolling road? Well, it's rocking about on the rolling road because the front part of the engine, the four wheels at the front, are held upon two pieces of wood and the rear wheels are not touching anything. So it's a little bit unstable. It's not going anywhere, but it's wobbling about. And I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm just cleaning some of the oil off the crosshead. 
because very shortly I'm going to video just the crosshead moving back and forth and I want it to be nice and clean just for the video. This is the fire grate sat in the ash pan and even though this engine is not really finished in as much as it's not been painted if you look at the state of the fire bars you can see that it's done quite a lot of running. I think I'll put a Blackgate's engineering stainless steel grate in this engine although I suppose there's still some life in this yet. The ash pan is held in place with what's known as a dump pin. It's called a dump pin because to dump the ash pan you pull out the pin and the ash pan and grate complete with what's left of the fire falls on the floor. The pin needed a bit of a tap with a hammer to seat it. These are the brake parts that came with the engine and they're quite fiddly to fit. The two long rods that you can see that pull the brake shoes on and off the wheels run down each side of the wheels and they finally meet up with an arm on a cross shaft that is operated by a steam cylinder. I didn't realise that steam brakes were such an early invention, but yes they were. The running boards and the big splashes are expertly crafted in brass, and these other parts are solid blocks of aluminium. The modular construction of this engine will make it much easier when it comes to the painting, because I can remove the aluminium blocks, fill in the countersunk screws that hold the brass caps on top of the blocks, and then paint them separately, then just refit them to the running boards. All I'm doing for the moment though is just giving all these parts a quick rub over with some Scotch Brite. Scotch Brite is like a scouring pad and it doesn't really mark the brass too badly, but it allows me to see what the condition of the brass is and removes any tarnish. Quite a while back I made a video called Pornography for Engineers, which was lots of moving parts going back and forth, so I could really add this to it. Just look at it, poetry in motion. Every mechanical part of this engine that I've looked at so far is very well made indeed. And just in case you're a beginner and don't know the terminology, this is the crosshead in the crosshead guides. And you don't need telling what this is. And it's rotating very, very slowly with a minimum of air pressure. Or very, very quickly if I turn up the pressure. Before running this engine for an extended period of time I thought I would put some water into the system because having the axle pump running dry is not a good idea. And the axle pump didn't work. So it's top tip time. If your axle pump doesn't work, tap it with a hammer. But don't use a hammer directly, use a piece of brass. And why am I doing this? I haven't gone mad. One or both of the balls in the valve chamber of the pump are sticking. But by tapping the valve chamber with a piece of brass like you've just seen me do, suddenly it freed off and started to work, as you can see from this clip. That's about it for this video. I'm very pleased with this engine, so I'm just going to let it run and let you hear it run without me speaking. So all I have to say is thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.